Lent. <laughs> six epistles, six readings today. We'll read here from two of them, and then uh, or just a, con a consideration <coughs> on this uh, Ember Saturday. There's six epistles, uh, six lessons, five lessons in the epistle, and each of the Ember days, praying for the uh, uh, for our um, we receive our, our sustenance on earth. In the Ember days, we're praying that we receive the uh, food and the sustenance that we need to survive on this earth to prepare for getting to the kingdom of heaven. And here the, the lesson we'll read, the book of, second book of Maccabees, uh, chapter 1. Third lesson. In those days... All the priests made prayer while the sacrifice was consuming, continuing, was, was consuming. Jonathan, beginning and beginning, and the rest uh, answering. And the prayer uh, and the prayer of Nehemiah was after this manner: O Lord God, Creator of all things, dreadful and strong, just and merciful, who alone art the good King, who alone art gracious. Who alone art just and almighty, and eternal, who deliverest Israel from all evil, who didst choose the fathers and, and, and didst sanctify them, receive the sacrifice of all thy people Israel, and preserve thy own portion, and sanctify it, that the Gentiles may know that thou art our God. And then the second epistle, and then the fifth one, or fourth one, also from the Old Testament, with Ecclesiastes chapter 36. Have mercy upon us, O God, of all, and behold us, and show us the light of thy mercies, and send thy fear upon the nations, that they may that, that they have not sought, that have not sought after thee, that they may know that there is no God beside thee, and that they may show forth thy wonders. Let up thy let up thy hand over, over the strange nations, that they may see thy power. For as thou hast been sanctified in us, in their sight, so thou shalt be magnified among them in our presence, that they may know, they know thee, as we have also known thee, known that there is no God beside thee, O Lord. Renew thy signs and work new miracles. Glorify thy hand and thy right arm. Raise up indignation and pour out wrath. Take away the adversary and crush the enemy. Hasten that time, and remember the end, that they may declare thy wonderful works, O Lord our God. And so the uh, few considerations. The Father, the Holy Ghost, amen. We have in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the considerations of the Mass today, the fact that one of our duties as Catholics, of course, is to, we want not only our people to have the faith, we want the whole world to have the faith. And that we want everyone to come to the knowledge and love of God. And this knowledge and love of God is supposed to be external and public. And so that not everyone, however, is going to accept God. Many souls are going to reject Him. Many nations are going to reject Him. Many people throughout the world are going to reject Him. And so part of our prayer is not only that the friends of God accept God, but also that the enemies of God accept God. And if they don't accept him because they turn from his enemies to his friends, then they will accept him by being pounded by God. So that there is a, the acceptance of the, of, the, of the enemies, it must be done. And remember also, we, we Catholics, you see it in the book of Psalms, many times by King David, and you see it also in, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the, the writings of the saints, that we don't only pray for the conversion of sinners, we don't just pray that the, the everyone converts. We do pray that everyone converts, but not everyone will convert. For instance, our Lord Jesus Christ did die on the cross so that uh, Judas would be saved. He died on the cross so that Caiaphas would be saved. He died on the cross so that the Jews of all time would be saved, and that those people who are outside the church would be saved. However, the majority of people reject the majority of people say no, and God will still be praised in them. One of the dogmas of our faith 
is God will be praised, God must be praised, and he will not only be praised by his friends, he shall be praised by his enemies. To be praised by his friends, right, is to be praised by his friends is a normal thing. But to be praised by his enemies is not. And so well, one of the proofs of the power of God is that he shall be praised by his enemies. One of these praisings is found in the book of Wisdom, chapter 5, where it speaks of the words of the damned. Now we have to remember here that not only uh, that lying is something that exists only on this earth. There is no lying in hell. And we see the words of the damned in hell. And they say, we fools, we estimated their life madness. But behold how they are in the presence of God and we suffer eternal punishment. We fools, they will recognize that they are fools. And we consider also, as, as, as St. Augustine used to consider, or, or later, maybe later than St. Augustine, hey, they say, consider the words, the praising words of the, the, the wicked Julian the Apostate. Julian the Apostate, he was trying to bring Rome back to paganism because Constantine made Rome Catholic. And many Romans were very angry about this. And so about 100 years later, or less than 100 years later, Julian the Apostate, who was, of course, baptized a Catholic, but he was always a pagan at heart, he wanted, when he became emperor, he said, I will make Rome pagan again. And I will destroy Catholicism. And he failed, and he died in the battlefield fighting against Catholics. And as he was dying, his last words were, Thou hast won, thou Galilean. And then he died. He did not go to heaven. He did not convert. But at his death, he actually praised the truth and praised God. And he recognized that the Galilean has won. And when he, when he said that, he showed the power of God, not only over the friends of God, but also over his enemies. And so it is a Catholic thing to pray for the defeat and the destruction of our enemies. It is done here by, the, by David in the Old Testament. It is done also by the great prophets. That we want God's glory to be shown amongst Gentiles. Since it's out of the prayer of Jonathan. And he was a great warrior. He was one of the five Maccabees. And he was a priest and he was a soldier. And he was fighting against the enemies of God and driving them out of Israel. That's what he was doing. And so what happened? He prayed, he said, Lord, but let thy name, let thy glory and thy power be known to the Gentiles. When David killed Goliath, the Philistines did not convert, but they saw the power of God and they fled the battlefield. When Sennacherib's 40,000 soldiers were killed and they were wiped out by the angel, Sennacherib and the, the, the army of the Assyrians, they did not uh, uh, repent, but they recognized the power of God. And even Balaam, the wicked prophet, he had to say, this God is more powerful than our God, and that this God is God. We can't defeat the God of the Jews. The only way you can defeat the Jews is get them to leave their God. And if you get them to leave their God, then they will be defeated. But if you don't get them to leave their God, they shall defeat us. We cannot defeat them. There will be many times in which the enemies of God, who do not love God, who do not follow God, shall have to manifest the glory of God. The souls in hell will say to God that he is God. They will say to God that they have received their just punishment. They will say to God that those whom they hated in this life are now in glory, where they themselves are damned, like Wisdom chapter 4. And then we see in the, in the, in the, in the prayer of Ecclesiasticus, in the time of the book of Kings, Ecclesiastes, he says, let the enemies know, let the nations know that thou art God. Let them know thy power. Let them feel thy wrath. They shall know that our God is God. When the small army of the, of the great monarch and the small followers of Jesus Christ defeat and destroy the enemies of God. We do want them to convert. We want everyone to convert. But those, not all, shall convert. And hence, the glory of God was shown on the very day of crucifixion itself when Dismas experienced the miracle of his eyes not being plucked out. As he was, tortured, he was crucified on a cross with the letter T, and the birds would pluck out the eyes. His eyes were not plucked out. The crows refused to do it. 
But Gesmos experienced the justice of God, who also died on the same day as St. Dismas on the cross. But he cursed God, he refused to repent, and crows and birds came and plucked out his eyes and ate him while he was still alive, whereas no bird did that to, uh, to, to St. Dismas. So that even in this life, will shall be seen that those that turn away from God, they shall receive punishment, and their punishment shows the glory of God. An example of this punishment with regard to sin, it shows forth the glory of God. When a man immerses himself to impure sins and then dies of venereal diseases, a man immerses himself in drunkenness and then dies of liver disease, his whole body is ripped apart. A man immerses himself in anger and hatred, and his guts are turned apart and he has ulcers. Ulcers show forth the glory of God. The liver disease shows forth the glory of God. And the venereal diseases that wipe out the impure show forth the glory of God. That God will be praised. And if you will not praise him by living according to his law, then his justice in your own flesh and his justice in your own families. For he who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Those people that live in violence, they are destroyed by violence. Let there be their own, their, the glory of God is shown, and the justice of God is shown in this life, and the world and God and the saints rejoice. When, when, uh, when St. Boniface was preaching a sermon on hell, or preaching a sermon on something very, very negative, about everyone in the state of mortal sin, and they need to go to hell, and they're going to hell if they don't repent. While he was giving that sermon back around the year 800, he saw an angel show to him the death of Charles Martel. Charles Martello in 741 had driven back the Muslims and stopped them from fully invading Europe. But he himself, though he defeated the Muslims, he was a very wicked king and persecuted the church and persecuted his own people. And he was a very wicked king. And then he died. And St. And Boniface, when he saw the death of Charles Martel, he immediately rejoiced. And he switched his sermon from a sermon of hellfire and damnation. He said, My children, rejoice and be glad with me, for Charles Martel is dead, and he now burns in hell. We must understand that we not only rejoice that sinners are repentant, we also rejoice that sinners are damned. And we must remember that as, we, as Catholics and followers of Jesus Christ, we have victory on every side. For the enemies that try to kill us and the enemies that try to destroy us, we pray for their conversions. And when they convert, Satan is driven out of them and they become our brothers and they become saints. And if they do not convert, we shall mock them for all eternity in the fires of hell. So we have two choices in which when we meet our enemies as the friends of God, we shall rejoice in their conversion or we shall rejoice in their damnation. We shall not have sorrow. There shall be no sorrow in the just. That is also one reason why even in this life, it says also in another one of the readings of the Mass today, that, that I mean the last reading, the epistle, St. Paul says, have joy always. We will have many, many tribulations and many struggles, and our enemies will fight against us, but we must have joy always. And we have a reason to rejoice. So when we discover that the great enemies of God have been executed, and the great enemies of God have been wiped out, and they have been killed by a plague, there is rejoicing. When Theodora, who persecuted the people of Milan, and persecuted the people of her empire, she was the most wicked empress in the time of St. John Chrysostom, and John Chrysostom was the bishop who defended the people against her wickedness, and St. John Chrysostom died, and the people wept and said, he was the only one who would defend us, who will defend us against her wickedness now? And three days after the death of John Chrysostom, the people prayed to St. John Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, you are now dead, but save us from Theodora. You protected us from all our wickedness, all the, the most wicked empress. You protected us during, her, during, during your life. Now you're dead. Please protect us. And there came a hailstorm, a normal hailstorm. And Theodora walked out in the hailstorm and she was killed by the hail. Now, people do get killed by hail once in a while. It's very rare. But she was killed by the hail. And then the people were saved, and they rejoice in the death of Theodora. So we must remember that we are a people of peace. We are a people who wants every single individual on earth, who want every single individual on earth to come to the blessings and to the life of God. But if they do not, 
we shall rejoice in their destruction. There shall be rejoicing. And so that we must remember, and this is pointed out in the sacred scripture today, and also remember, why is this? Because the glory of God must be shown. We'll notice this also, that we'll rejoice in the destruction of the enemies of God. We do not rejoice because of vengeance. Remember when God says in the sacred scripture, vengeance is mine, I shall repay. We often think of that passage, you made me mad, you, you stole my money, you burned down my house, uh, you stole everything I have and I can't get back at you, but vengeance is mine, said the Lord, he's going to take vengeance on you for me. No, that's not what the passage of scripture says. Who is saying, our God says, vengeance is mine. I'm the only one who has the right to vengeance. And the reason is quite simple. Because I don't even possess my own body. So if someone cuts it apart, I shouldn't be overly disturbed about it. It's not mine. It's just like that's why I remember when all the health was taken away from Job. What did Job say? The Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away. Naked was I born, naked shall I return to the earth. So why should I be bothered by a few boils and some sickness and the fact that all the things that God gave me are being taken away? Why did Job say that? Because of the first part of that passage of sacred scripture. Vengeance is mine, not Job's. Vengeance is God's. Vengeance is not Job's. And when the enemies of God are given time to repent, and time to repent, and even the Antichrist, who will burn in hell one day, the Antichrist shall be given by God so many millions of graces to repent, so many opportunities to turn back to God. And one day, God shall say, Enough! You have gone enough against my goodness, enough against my justice, and today I take vengeance. Vengeance belongs only to God, because God alone can be purely and truly wronged. I cannot be wronged for two reasons. One, everything I have is not mine anyway, so therefore I can't be wronged. And secondly, I have done so much wrong in my own life, that I, whatever wrong is done to me, I deserve a punishment for my sins. And so therefore I have no right to seek vengeance. But... The vengeance of God, the zeal of God, zealous dolls they comedic me. I give the example of the sacred scripture when the when when the, the, the man came, one of the prophets came remember, went into the fat king who was enemy of God. We read the name of the fake, extremely fat king. And the prophet said, I have a message from God, but it is a secret message only for you. And then they closed the door and said, this is the message from God. And he took a sword and he pierced, he said, the zeal of God filled his arms of the prophet. And he penetrated the, the, the sword so much into the fat man, the fat king, that the hilt of the sword went into him. And he tried to pull the sword out, but he could not. The sword was completely buried in his flesh. He said, this is the message from God. And the scripture tells us the prophet was filled with zeal, and the zeal gave great strength to his arm, and the zeal made him penetrate with the sword the guts of that wicked king, and the wicked king died, and he received a message from God. Not every message from God is you're going to be given some blessing. A message from God might be it is now time for your judgment Vengeance is mine, I shall repay, is the word applied only to God. And Catholics pray for the vengeance of God to be done in his own time. And we pray for the conversion of all sinners. And then, when those sinners do not convert, when they have rejected the, the, the grace of God, we pray for their damnation. We pray for their judgment. And judgment shall come. We need not fear the enemies of God. It's also one thing we know that, uh, by natural reason. We look at the world around us and we see the beauty of nature and the good of nature. And we see that everything that appears to be bad, such as poop, every single thing disappears and turns into something good. And we, we see that death in nature, when it happens, it turns into something good. The death of one animal becomes the life of another. The decay becomes the life of the plants. And we see that every single thing that appears to be evil in nature turns to good. And we see also, therefore, that the God who did this, when there is a God who created these things, when he sees real evil, which is the sin of man, he will remedy it. 
He will, and when he sees innocence punished, which is what happens in this life, when the sinners attack the just, they shall be rewarded. The reward shall be given to the just, they shall receive a reward of, of joy in heaven, and the reward shall be given to the damned. They shall receive eternal damnation, and we desire both rewards. We don't just desire the reward of the just. We desire the reward of the damned. There will come a time when they shall receive their reward. When the devil gets angry, he gets a little bit angry. He does not know what wrath is. His wrath is compared to the wrath of a woman. When God gets angry, this anger is deep and it shall never be stopped. And this is anger compared to the anger of a man. A man is supposed to be angry because something is done wrong and because of injustice. A woman is supposed to be angry because someone was hurt or because I was hurt. A personal type of anger. And then when she gets when she fights, it's a vicious and personal fight. Which is why, for instance, when a woman does fight, she is far more vicious than a man in a fight because he's fighting for life. And a man gets tired in a fight because he's fighting for stuff. And so the man doesn't have the ability to fight as strongly in an external fight as a woman. And yet the woman continues because of a personal aspect of the fight. Now the devil, when he fights, he fights in a manner like a woman. And the God, when he fights, he fights in a manner like a man. And when that fight is about real justice and not about selfishness, and when that fight is about real goodness, then he cannot be stopped. When he fights for his own stuff and when he fights for his own things, he fights in a feminine way. When he fights for the rights of God, when he fights for the justice, he fights in a manly way. And that's why Jesus Christ, God the Son, became man. Because he's a warrior who will fight in a manly way for the glory of his Father, not for himself. And for the goodness and justice in the world created by God to be put back in order. And when this fight, when this anger happens, it does not stop until the evil is righted. This anger cannot be prevented. And furthermore, those who love God must hate evil. Those who love God must hate Satan. Those who love good must hate evil. Those who want to go to heaven and be with God face to face must desire that those who die without his justice go to hell. Remember, one of the heresies and one of the great sins and lies of Catholics, of, 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 of heretics in the last 2,000 years, is that the damned may one day be saved, and that God may one day close the doors of hell, and God may one day let the damned out. We do not desire one soul in hell to be released. We desire eternal punishment for every soul that is in hell. His time of repentance was on this earth. His time of repentance ended at the moment of his death, and now it is a time of justice, and let the justice be done for the glory of God. And God is infinite, therefore his justice must be infinite. He has vengeance, his vengeance must be infinite. He has mercy, his mercy must be infinite. And those that die in the grace of God, they are forgiven forever. And those that die the enemy of God, they are condemned forever. And we do not feel sorry for them, and we do not desire them to be taken out of the, out of the fires of hell. We want them there to stay and to burn forever in order to show the glory of God. So that when the souls in heaven are walking around and look down to the center of the earth and they see the souls in hell burning, crushed together in a very small space, with the damned, with the, da with the, with the fallen angels, we shall rejoice that this is the right ending for sin. And they have received their just reward and may they receive it forever and we shall not feel sorry for them. Not at all. We pray as Catholics, not only that the friends of God remain his friends, not only that the enemies of God repent and become his friends, but we pray that those who do not repent, or those who, like Judas, have the truth and then turn away from it and do not repent, that they receive an eternal just reward in the fires of hell, and we pray the whole world sees it, because justice might only be done, it must be seen to be done. Hence, St. Jonathan said in his prayer, priest and soldier, may the Gentiles see thy glory. And then in the book of Ecclesiasticus, may the Gentiles see thy glory. 
They don't believe in God. Let them know that thou art God, and they shall know when their gods are crushed. St. Boniface, when he went to Germany, and he said, they said, this is our God. And there was a tree that said, this is our God. And he said, give me an axe, and I will show you what's to be done with your God. And he cut the tree down. It was such a big tree that it took him three days to cut it down. And they said, we're going to kill you. And he says, I am representing my God. Let your God come and kill me and see if I get tired. And for three days, he cut that tree without stopping for any reason, all day and all night. And they gathered round to see if he would grow tired. They gathered round to see if he couldn't finish the job. They gathered round to see if their God would, would, kill, would kill Boniface. But Boniface slew their God. And then they repented. He did not only come and say to them that our God is a true God. He said, this God is a devil and he must be destroyed. That's what he said. It is not enough for us to say, let us love God. It's not enough to say, let us follow God. Or to believe the truth and let everyone repent. There must come a time of justice. And there will come a time of justice at God's own time. And when that time comes, those who do not repent, we shall rejoice in their receiving the wrath of God, and the nations shall all praise him forever, either praising him in the justice of the experiences of the fires of hell, or praising him in the divine mercy and divine goodness of the place of heaven. But all shall praise, and we shall rejoice that all praise. We shall rejoice either with the just, which we hope to be with, or we shall rejoice with those who are going to be damned. We're going to rejoice with the damned. We're not, not with the damned. We're going to rejoice because the damned are damned. We shall not have any sorrow over one soul lost. And, and, we, and, and, and for God's glory will be shown in it. And we shall have great joy in all things. For as St. Paul says, all things are unto good to those that are of the household of the faith. Let's stay of that household not be stirred by the little difficulties you run into in this life, because all shall be righted. All evils shall be righted. Let us bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.